The two main principles of the valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, or the VSEPR theory, are number one, regions of high electron density repel one another. These regions are going to get as far away as possible. And we have two main types of regions of high electron density. We have shared regions of high electron density and unshared electron density. The shared regions of electron density I've represented by the purple balloons. And we can imagine these spheres as atoms, the nuclei of the atom. And if you have two shared electrons between two nuclei, then we have one region of shared electron density. High RHED, region of high electron density. If we have four shared electrons, we still only have one region of high electron density. So these different types of shared regions of high electron density, and then the unshared or lone pair of electrons. Lone pair of electrons are two non bonded electrons on a central atom. So we can imagine we have this central atom and it's not bonded to another atom. It's simply got these two valence electrons around that central atom taking up space. Well, these unshared regions of electron density are these lone pairs, <laughs> two electrons, remember a pair, so these two electrons take up a little bit more room than these shared regions of electron density. If we have two shared electrons, this is just a single region of high electron density single region of electron density, just a single bond. Two ele shared electrons, that's a single bond. That's a single region of electron density. If we have four shared electrons, then we have a double bond. Notice a double bond is just a single region of shared electron density. If we have six shared electrons, then we have a triple bond. That triple bond is a single region of high electron density. A resonance bond is when we have a non-integer, not a whole number, bond order uh, due to resonance structure. So we don't have a single bond or a double bond, but we have a resonance bond. Well, that's still just a single region of shared high electron density. So if we were to tie two of these regions of electron density together, so we're imagining that we're going to take a central atom and we've got two atoms bonded to the central atom, well, the shared electrons between each of the atoms are going to repel one another. They're negatively charged, negatively charged electrons repel, and they're going to get as far away as possible. So it's 180 degrees from the green ball to the yellow ball. If we have three electron regions around a central atom, then we would predict the bond angle to be 120 degrees. So from this green atom to this green atom it would be 120 degrees. Now remember that all the way around is a circle 360. 360 divided by 3 would be 120. So we predict that 120 degrees. But if our central atom, instead of having three bonded shared regions of electron density, if one of these atoms is not here, we have a central atom that's bonded to two atoms, so two shared regions of electron density, and one is an unshared lone pair of electrons, then we would predict the bond angle to be close to 120 because we have one, two, three, three regions getting as far away as possible, 360 divided by 3, 120. But because this repulsion of the non-bonded electrons is a little bit greater than from the bonded uh, regions of electron density, uh, that bond angle is going to get slightly less than that 120. So you can see here 120, well because this shared non-bonded lone pair of electrons takes up a little bit more space then we would predict that it would be something like 119. Like just a little bit less than 120. And again it depends on the molecule and we'd actually need more data to, to experimentally determine the bond angles. But the VSEPR theory can help us make an approximation. If we add a fourth electron density to this central atom, we now have a new molecular shape called a tetrahedral. Tetrahedral has 109.5 degree bond angles between each and every one of the two atoms and the central atom. So pick any two of these uh, ligand atoms and the central atom, and this bond angle we would predict is 109.5 degrees. 
so we have four regions, but instead of all four being bonded regions, one of them is a non-bonded lone pair of electrons, then we would still predict very, very close to 109.5 degrees, but slightly less. Uh, this would be the case of ammonia, where you have a central nitrogen, three hydrogens attached to that central nitrogen, and there's a lone pair of electrons on that central nitrogen. Well, we would predict four electron regions, tetrahedral electronic geometry, but we predict a molecular geometry of trigonal pyramid. The trigonal pyramid has um, slightly less than the 109.5 degree bond angles because of the extra repulsion of the non-bonded lone pair of electrons. It's called a trigonal bipyramid and we have 120 degree bond angles on these equatorial positions on of the base of the of the pyramid and we have 90 degree angles and 120, 180 degree bond angles. So we have 120 90 and 180. This might be easier to see the axial and the equatorial if we use a model kit instead of the balloons where we realize, okay, there's our central atom. These gray bonds just simply represent a region of high electron density and I've colored the balls with the green in the equatorial position and the blue in the axial position where you'll notice that you've actually got these two different positions of atoms in this case where in the axial position they have 90 degree bond angles with the central atom and the equatorial position and then we have 180 degree angles between the two atoms in the axial position and then when we look at it on the front view we see well here's our trigonal planar atoms the green ones with the 120 degree angles so on this um, two-dimensional representation of this three-dimensional structure you'll see okay here's our 90 degrees here we have 120 degrees and from this B to that B the 180 degree the uh, equatorial atoms are the ones with the 120 degree angles. This fat wedge here just simply means it's coming towards me in the plane of the paper. This dotted wedge simply means it's going back away from me in the plane of the board. So A is our central atom. B, 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 B. B just means the uh, bonded electron regions. So the atoms between um, being with electron regions between the two atoms. If you have six regions of high electron density around a central atom, then you'll get this octahedral shape where you have uh, six equally spaced 90 degree angles. It'll be easier to, again to see in a model. We have the central atom surrounded by one, two, three, four, five, six. Six atoms gives us the octahedral shape. The Vesper theory allows us to quickly predict the electronic geometry and molecular geometry of a molecule based on the chemical formula. Once you have a chemical formula and you're able to get a Lewis structure for that formula, then you can figure out the electronic and the molecular geometry. The electronic geometry is the shape of a molecule including all regions of high electron density. So let's consider sulfur dioxide. We had a central sulfur, two oxygen atoms surrounding that sulfur. The electronic geometry would simply be one, two, three, three regions of high electron density, trigonal planar. Three regions, planar, trigonal planar. The molecular geometry is what does this molecule actually look like ignoring the presence of this lone pair of electrons? What is the geometry of the atomic nuclei in the molecule? Well, that would be bent. And we would predict, based on the electronic geometry, 120 degrees. But because we realize that one of these is a non-bonded electron, it's actually going to be slightly less than 120, maybe 119. It depends on the molecule. So now let's use the Vesper theory to predict the electronic and molecular geometries of carbon dioxide. The first thing we have to do is 
draw a Lewis dot structure. To draw the Lewis dot structure, you need to figure out which one of the atoms is the least electronegative, and we're going to put that in the center. Well, carbon versus oxygen, carbon is less electronegative. Remember, electronegativity increases you go across the periodic table, with fluorine being the most electronegative. So carbon versus oxygen, oxygen is more electronegative. So we're going to put the carbon in the center, surround it by the oxygens, and now when we draw the Lewis dot structure, all we can work with are the valence electrons. Remember, valence electrons are the electrons in the outermost shell of an atom that are available for bonding. And we can quickly look at the periodic table and tell the number of valence electrons based on the group number. Carbon is in group 4 or 14 or 4A, depends on the periodic table, but that big 4, that's why I wrote it in purple to help you see. All of that group has four valence electrons. So I like to keep up with them, just drawing the Lewis dot structure for the atom. So I recognize carbon has four. It's fine if you want to do the math and say, okay, we have four valence electrons from the carbon. The oxygen is in group six. So remember, all of group six has six valence electrons, six electrons in the outermost shell. So we'll draw those. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Just drawing the Lewis dot structure for the atoms that go in to make the molecule. Or you could think about here that we have six plus six. We have 12 plus four. We have 16 total valence electrons <clears throat> in that carbon dioxide. And remember the Lewis dot structures are structures where we draw the atoms with the valence electrons surrounding them. And we want each of the atoms to get a complete octet. In order for an oxygen to have an octet, a complete octet, it has six valence electrons. It needs two more. We can see this on the periodic table, that if it has six valence electrons, it needs two more to get its octet. So each of these oxygens need two more valence electrons to get their octet. <clears throat> well, that's really convenient because carbon has four valence electrons and it needs four more to get its octet. So, if we form double bonds between each of the oxygens and the carbons, then now this carbon feels like instead of just having four valence electrons, it feels like it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight has its octet, the oxygen feels like it has its octet, all the atoms have their octet. So we're going to erase these ugly, scribbledy, connect the dots mess, and we're going to redraw the molecule with the double bonds to represent the four shared electrons between each of those atoms. So we here we have two regions of electron density. Remember a double bond is just a single region of electron density. We could represent that with a model, with our model kit, with the black atom as a carbon and the two oxygens surrounding them. And they're going to get as far away as possible. And so we can predict that this bond angle between the oxygen, carbon, oxygen would be 180 degrees. So now notice that carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide have very different electronic and molecular geometries. Carbon dioxide has two electron regions, linear electronic and molecular geometry. Sulfur dioxide has a non-bonded electron pair on the central sulfur, a lone pair. Remember our little lone pair guy? of electrons around the central sulfur and then two regions of electron density around that central sulfur. Now yes, sulfur dioxide has different resonance structures that you can draw, uh, but still it doesn't matter if it's a resonance bond or a double bond, uh, we're going to treat them as just a high region of, region of high electron density. Two regions of shared regions one non-bonded unshared region. This sulfur dioxide has a bent molecular geometry where the carbon dioxide has the linear geometry. This actually affects the dipole moment of a molecule. Um, 
A dipole moment is just if you have a net region of negative or positive somewhere on one side of the molecule. Uh, sulfur dioxide has a dipole moment where you have a net region of partial negative on this side. The dipole will actually point down um, towards this side of that molecule where you have a partial negative over here and a partial positive over here because oxygen is more electronegative than sulfur. So we look at the periodic table again and we notice that this sulfur is not going to be as electronegative as the oxygen. There's going to be a pull of electrons towards that oxygen and we could draw that as a bond dipole pointing this oxygen is unequally sharing the electron with the sulfur. You're going to have a partial negative on this oxygen, a partial negative on this oxygen with a resulting partial negative down here at the bottom side of on this side of the molecule where we have a net region of negative, a net region of positive. We would predict that this molecule would have a dipole moment and that it would actually be polar. Polar, like the north and the south pole, positive and a negative region. So negative region down here on this side of the molecule, positive region over here. Um, but in the case of carbon dioxide, Yes, we have polar covalent bonds where we have an unequal sharing of the electrons where the oxygen is going to pull the electron density towards itself in that chemical bond um, away from the carbon. It's an electron hog. The more electronegative atom is the more electronegative hog. You're going to get this partial negative over here and a partial negative over here. But these bond dipoles are equal and symmetric there is no net dipole where one side of the molecule has a negative and the other side has a positive. It's going to have a partial negative on either side, on both sides of the molecule, but it's equal and symmetric. I like to think of it as they're playing tug of war and to figure out does a molecule polar, does it have a bond dipole or not. Say <clears throat> if this carbon is playing tug of war with this oxygen and that oxygen, these two oxygens are going to pull equally and we're at a standstill. If we're at a standstill, we're playing that tug of war, there's going to be no net dipole. The, the bond dipoles are going to be equal and symmetric, nonpolar would be the prediction, and no bond dipole. In this case though, if we were playing tug of war and this sulfur and the oxygen, again the oxygen is stronger, these two oxygens are stronger, and we're pulling, we're not equal and symmetric, we're not linear, we're bent, it's going to be moving and we say yes it's polar. There is going to be a bond dipole that's going in this down direction with the more negative region over here, more positive region up here. This sulfur dioxide we would predict to have a bond dipole. Carbon dioxide, no. So if we have a molecule that has this AB2 um, geometry, the structure where there's no non-bonded lone pairs of electrons, they're not on that central atom, uh, so it's just AB2, then we would know that the electronic geometry is linear, linear, the molecular geometry is linear, and if these two atoms that are bonded to that central atom are the same, then the net dipole would be zero, it would be no net dipole, we would predict that it would not be polar. If this atom were a different atom to where these bond dipoles would not be equal and symmetric and we're playing tug of war, one of them is more electro one of them is more electronegative than the other, then there would be a net dipole towards the more electronegative atom. We have three electron regions getting as far away as possible with no lone pairs of electrons, no un shared electron regions. Uh, then we have this AB3 structure. An example of that would be if the central atom were a boron and then three fluorines or aluminum, three chlorines. Uh, any uh, carbonyl, or if you have a C double bonded to an O and then two other groups, we would expect to have this um, 
three electron regions getting as far away as possible 120 degree bond angle with the electronic geometry trigonal planar, the molecular geometry trigonal planar as well. If these three atoms were the same atoms and we were trying to determine are, is this does this molecule have a dipole moment or not, then uh, if it's, it would all be equal and symmetric. We can imagine if they're all playing tug of war, uh, then the net dipole would cancel. If you've taken physics and you know about um, adding vectors, we can think of the bond dipoles as three vectors, and if we add them together, and if the vector adds to zero, then it would be uh, no uh, no net dipole. Um, if you've never had physics, you don't know what a vector is, the tug of war analogy works, that if they're playing tug of war, it's equal and symmetric, there's no net movement, there would be no net dipole. But if one of these atoms were a different, more electronegative atom, then now we could have a bond dipole. Uh, so say if this were a C double bonded to an O, then we could have a polarity where you'd have more electron density on this oxygen and we'd have a net dipole in a certain direction so we could predict that it is polar. The polarity of a molecule is so important uh, concept in chemistry because it allows us to make predictions about solubility, it makes it allows us to make predictions about reactivity, um, about boiling point, melting point properties. It's very, very important if we have, again, three electron regions, but instead of having one of these as a bonding shared region, we have an unshared lone pair of electrons, then we'd have this AB to U1, or just U, saying that there's one lone pair of electrons uh, around that central atom. Then the electronic geometry is still trigonal planar. Remember, the electronic geometry includes all of the electron regions three of them, trigonal planar, getting as far away as possible, we predict about 120, but because there's that lone pair of electrons, we predict it's going to be slightly less than 120, maybe 119, maybe 118, it, it kind of depends on the molecule and we need more data to, to actually determine the exact um, bond angle, but we can get pretty close using this VSEPR theory. Um, the molecular geometry is what does it look like? Well, it looks like it's bent. Now let's look at what if we had something like methane, CH4, where we have uh, four electron regions getting as far away as possible. Then we have this tetrahedral electronic geometry, and the molecular geometry is the same because we don't have any U's. We don't have any unbonded electron lone pairs of electrons. It's all bonded regions, so tetrahedral electronic, tetrahedral molecular. We can look at the model and we see all of these atoms nice and neatly equal and symmetric around that central A atom. So if these atoms were like a carbon and four hydrogens um, playing tug-of-war, then there's again a uh, no net dipole um, all of these atoms are equal and symmetric. If one of these atoms were different, now we no longer have that equal and symmetric case. And if this atom were very highly electronegative, then you would have a net dipole. So if they're all the same atoms, then we would predict no net dipole. If one of them is different, then yeah, we would predict a dipole. We predict a pull towards the more electronegative region. Uh, if we had two atoms that were more electronegative, then we would predict, yes, there would be a dipole region of negative on that side of the molecule. If we have three bonding regions and one non-bonded un or non-shared electron region, then we have the electronic geometry of one, two, three, four, four regions, tetrahedral. So we would expect it to um, look like this. So notice um, with our balloons, we can see that pyramid. It's no longer all in the same plane because that non-bonded electron pair repels these regions of electron density, causing this trigonal pyramid shape for the molecular geometry. So here it is with our model kit. We can see that these atoms are not actually all in the same plane. So this molecule 
by its own nature is not equal and symmetric. Um, there would be, if we have differences in electronegativity value, if we had uh, polar covalent comp bonds, there would be a net region of partial and negative depending on which one is more electronegative, but whichever atom would be more electronegative, we would have a region of negative. So if we had like ammonia, nitrogen with three H's, the nitrogen is more electronegative than the hydrogen, we would have a net region of negative up here, net region of positive down here. We would predict ammonia to be a polar molecule, um, simply from its geometry. So the Vesper model is very helpful in that case. If we have a central atom with two shared electron regions and two unshared electron regions, then the electronic geometry is tetrahedral, the molecular shape is bent. If we replace one of the bonded shared electron regions with a non-bonded electron region or shared electron region, then we have the new geometry of AB2U2, so we have two unpaired regions, two shared regions, and the electronic geometry is tetrahedral, one, two, three, four, four regions. The molecular geometry is what does it actually look like it's bent? Well, it's bent with approximately 109.5 degrees because we have four regions, but it's going to be even less, even less than we had with only one. Because remember that these non- bonded lone pairs of electrons repel one another, they take up a little bit more space and so this angle is going to be quite a bit less than the 109.5. Um, this is the case of water. This is so important for water because uh, water, you have an oxygen in the center, two hydrogens, and then two lone pairs of electrons causing that HOH bond to be bent. It's bent, making this a polar molecule. The oxygen is more electronegative than the hydrogens. The more electron region is going to be up here on this oxygen than down here on this hydrogen. The net dipole would be pointing up towards the oxygen where we have a partial negative region up here and a partial positive region down here. If we have five electron regions and they're all shared regions, then the electronic geometry is trigonal bipyramid and the molecular geometry is trigonal bipyramid. If one of the electron regions is a non-bonded lone pair of electrons, then we have this new um, seesaw molecular geometry. The electronic geometry is still trigonal bipyramid, one, two, three, four, five, five regions trigonal bipyramid, but the molecular geometry, they call it the seesaw because it looks kind of like a seesaw going back and forth like this. Um, call it the seesaw. So uh, if you look at the uh, two-dimensional drawing of it, you realize, okay, one atom is coming towards me, one is going back, three of those atoms are all in the same plane, and the plane we could bring it around and put three of them all in the same plane with one going back or one coming forward. But uh, really this is one where you just really need to um, play with it and it's kind of a fun one because it makes the molecular geometry of a seesaw. This is AB4U1. If we have AB3U2, so um, again one of the equatorial positions are replaced with a non-bonded electron region. Now in this case the equatorial positions um, are going to be the position where we're going to have the most space. So the AB3 U2 electronic geometry is still trigonal by pyramid, one, two, three, four, five, five regions, but the molecular geometry is T-shaped. If we rotate this around we can see the T and it's a T shaped. So again it could be drawn like this or like this, different orientations, but uh, the key is that we have these 90 degree bond angles. The molecular geometry is T shaped, electronic trigonal bipyramid. If we replace the final equatorial position with a non-bonded electron pair, then we have 
the linear geometry again. So we can have linear molecular geometry, uh, but yet electronic geometry of trigonal bipyramid. AB2, U1, 2, 3. AB2, U3. If we have the AB6 structure, this is the octahedral. AB6 is the same electronic and molecular geometry, which is octahedral. This is a nice symmetric molecule. We don't have the axial or equatorial positions because all of the bond angles are 90 degrees. If we remove one of the bonds and replace it with a lone pair of electrons, we get the new square pyramid molecular geometry. The shape looks like this, where we've got a square pyramid. Uh, again, the molecular geometry, we're not taking in consideration this lone pair of electrons. It looks like a square pyramid, so that is the molecular geometry. If we remove another bonded region, put in a lone pair of electrons, then we have a square planar molecular geometry. Square planar, we could draw it all on the same plane, like I did here. Or we could show it where these two bonds are coming towards me. These two bonds here are going back away from me. And these two non-bonded uh, regions are above and below that square planar geometry.